to the Fit for Privacy podcast with Punit Bhatia. This is the podcast for those who care about their privacy. Here, your host, Punit Bhatia, has conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas, and opinions relating to privacy, data protection, and related matters. Be aware that the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are not legal advice. Let us get started. Do you know that Australia has a data protection law and it's based on the OECD principles, but still it's different from the EU data protection regime and it is going through a change. So in today's episode, we are going to talk to Stephen Bollinger, who's the chief privacy officer at National Australian Bank and also the country manager at IAPP Australia. So none better than him because he has served as a CPO in multiple organizations and he brings his experience of being a CPO, being in privacy field, and he also understands technology. So let's go and take a listen to what he has to share about Australian data protection regime. So here we are with Stephen Bollinger. Welcome, Stephen. Uh, thanks very much, Punit. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I really appreciate you asking me. Thank you so much. And let's start with a standard question. Mm. When you think about GDPR, what's the one word that comes to your mind? Well, I have given this some thought because I've listened to your other episodes. So I, I, I knew this is one of the ones that, uh, that you ask. Uh, I would say propulsive. Propulsive, that's a very different word. Explain us. Sure, sure. So I think it has propelled things forward in, in many ways. I think, it's, I think it's propelled data protection forward for Europeans uh, by you know, raising the expectations and obligations on organizations uh, and, and increasing protections for individuals. I think it's propelled a broader awareness, uh, in, not just within Europe, but ar around the world. Uh, there are people today who talk about uh, privacy and data protection who are not in our field. Uh, and and many of them uh, know what GDPR is, or at least or, or at least have heard of it. Uh, it's it's propelled our profession forward. Uh, the, the GDPR has sparked um, the hiring, not just of, of DPOs in, in Europe, uh, but in privacy and data protection teams, uh, again, uh, around the world. Uh, and, and finally, I think it's propelled other countries uh, to look, and, and their governments, uh, to come forward with more comprehensive uh, privacy and data protection laws. I mean, if, if we look at uh, Brazil and, and uh, China, and Japan and and Thailand, uh, all these all, all of these countries uh, are have either introduced new privacy laws or updated their existing ones, largely uh, on you know with uh, with reference to to GDPR, and and now we're going through a comprehensive review here uh, of our law in Australia, and uh, and GDPR is undoubtedly an influence on that. So that propulsive. That makes sense. It is indeed propulsive, as you say. So you have started as a technologist, if I may call it like that. Then mm -hmm. you did the law and you have seen privacy evolve over the years. So what is it that you've seen it evolve in the last, say, 10, 20 years? And how did it change? Yeah, uh, well, I think the... The, the biggest change that I've seen is is privacy has gone from you know what you know maybe maybe 10, 10 to 15 years ago was was largely a compliance focused um, tick box exercise in in many organizations uh, to becoming something that is much more strategically important uh, for organizations uh, that expect to build their future uh, on on data. Uh, and so I think the way, uh, the way privacy functions are organized within uh, organizations has changed, uh, but really it's that, um, it's, that, it's that core motivation in that, of course, compliance is still important, um, but that becomes uh, basically table stakes, something that everybody has to do yeah. 
Uh, but the real interesting part of our profession is is when it gets up a level beyond compliance uh, into into that strategy. That's interesting. And when you say it has moved from compliance to more of a strategic differentiator or customer trust or whatever we call it, mm. there are different sized companies and you have had experience in three different continents. You have also worked in small or say mid-sized and big companies. Uh, how do you see that difference in the approaches different countries or different uh, organizations are taking, especially when they are different scaled or different sized organizations. Do you see a difference? Because uh, a small company cannot afford to be so strategic. They are more reactive, while a large company can afford to be strategic because they have deep pockets. So what's your view on that perspective? Yeah, I, I think there, uh, there are certainly different approaches to it and that will vary by you know, the resources that, that we have. Uh, and you're right that small small organizations are generally lean and um, and their focus is not on uh, is not usually on privacy unless they are specifically a you know privacy technology uh, provider. Um, nonetheless, even with you know, smaller investments, I think they can start building uh, privacy uh, pri privacy focused uh, components of their uh, of their products and services. You know, it it doesn't take a team of of ten or twenty people to think about uh, uh, privacy by design. It's it's a matter of having that willingness in the culture to have those conversations early. So even if you have you know one resource or a half a resource that you've you know sent off to get some training at IAPP, um, you know do do courses uh, understand what's expected from a privacy by design standpoint. Uh, that that person can be invaluable to a development team internally, even at a very small uh, startup, uh, to help ask the questions that they need to answer as they're as they're thinking about uh, the design uh, of a product or service. Really, getting in early is is so important uh, in in the work that we do. Um, so, uh, I, I think there's there's certainly different approaches. There are different. Um, challenges that you have to deal with in a large organization that you don't have to deal with in a small one, like how much do you federate out a privacy function versus having one centralized function that everybody in the company has to come to, or having uh, privacy champions out in different parts of the business. Uh, I, I've, I've, seen, I've seen companies go through cycles where they, they, they shift from one model to the next and, and usually land somewhere in between. Uh, and that's one of the challenges you don't have to face uh, in a in a small company, uh, because you have that um, uh, you, you can move so much more quickly and just make decisions. Uh, the challenge is you, you don't have uh, as much of the resources to do some of the things that you may want to do. Indeed. And I think you hit the nail on the head by saying what matters is the intent of the top management. If you have the intent, whether you're a small company or a large company, you would make things happen. And of course, based on your size and scale and your regions in which you operate, things will be different. But talking mm -hmm. about regions, you come from Australia. So tell us something about the Australian data protection regime. What's going on in that space? Sure. Um, and I should clarify, I'm not uh, Australian yet. I'm American, uh, but I, I, uh, I do, I've lived here for uh, the last, uh, the last uh, six, six years uh and um so i i guess to to tell you a bit about australia's uh, uh privacy regime uh, it's a principles-based regime uh there are both uh, federal and state uh and state laws the uh, australia's federal privacy act applies to the commonwealth government the federal government and to private organizations and most australian states and territories uh, have some form of privacy or information act, which apply to state entities. Uh, and then there are also some sectoral uh, laws in, in particular around uh, health privacy. But the, the federal privacy act is what is most likely to apply to a business operating in Australia. And that's been around since 1988. Uh, it's, mm. it's undergone a number of changes since then. The, 
The, the most recent comprehensive change was in 2012 uh, and, and made effective in, in 2014. And if you look at the act, you'll see that it's, it's aligned uh, with the OECD privacy framework. Uh, there are 13 Australian privacy principles uh, and those govern the collection use and disclosure of personal information, uh, an organization's uh, governance uh, and accountability, uh, integrity and correction of personal information, access rights uh, for individuals. So largely, um, you know, pretty typical things that you would see in, uh, in privacy laws uh, around the world. Uh, I should call out, I know a lot of your audience is in Europe. Uh, we use the term personal information in Australia rather than uh, personal data and the term sensitive information rather than special categories of data. Uh, as, as you would expect, uh, the APPs cover uh, topics like providing uh, privacy notices to, to, to individuals, uh, obtaining consent for certain collections and uses, uh, security measures over personal information, uh, protections related to cross-border transfers, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, complying with, with requests from individuals for access or, or correction of their personal information. Uh, we've got uh, a regulator uh, who enforces it is the, uh, the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, or OAIC, uh, as we refer to it. And the maximum penalty that, uh, that the OAIC can pursue through the courts is 2.1 million Australian dollars, which is just over uh, 1.4 million euros. Hmm. Interesting. So when you explain the data protection regime, it seems like at least at the highest level, quite similar to the EU regime or any other privacy regime, because there are rights, there are principles, there are rules, there are breach laws, and then uh, breach rules, and then there are fines. And then I presume there's something around consent or legitimate purposes as well. And uh, then what are the differences? Or are there any differences with between the EU and the Australian data protection regime? Yes, uh, there, there are quite a few differences. Um, and so you're right, from a principle standpoint, we start at you know, largely the same place, but when you get into the particulars, uh, you start to see some of those differences. So I, I suppose as, as a foundational issue, uh, Australia's Privacy Act is not supported by a broader human rights regime that establishes privacy uh, and, and data protection as a fundamental human right. So we have no legally enforceable equivalent to say uh, articles seven and eight uh, of the EU's uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, now to get into some of the substance of the Privacy Act, uh, personal information, the definition of personal information is a great place to start. Uh, we define that as information or, or opinions about an identified or identifiable uh, individual. Now, that's not the full. That's not the full definition. I, I won't bore you with reading the legal uh, <laughs> definition. But the key word there, and the and the point of contention uh, in, in one respect and distinction, uh, is that it's uh, information which is about an identifiable uh, person. Mm -hmm. And and the distinction there is uh, is with say GDPR, uh, which relates to uh, an individual. And, and so this has caused some Australian organizations to, uh, to, to use this to defend a position that says, well, um, technical metadata such as IP addresses or ne other network information aren't really about an individual, uh, but rather they're about network equipment or traffic on our network uh, even if that information uh, may ultimately disclose an identifiable individual's uh, location information, uh, for instance, and so it hinges on this on this one word of is it does it relate to an individual, uh, as as the GDPR would say, or is it about an individual? So we may see some change there, and I know we'll talk about um, some potential changes coming to our market uh, now. Kind of moving beyond the definitional uh, issue of personal information, you won't find the, um, the kind of neat list of lawful bases for processing that you have in Article 6 
uh, of GDPR uh, in our Privacy Act. Uh, of course, consent is one of the justifications for uh, collection of personal information. And there's something similar to legitimate interests uh, in that organizations can collect personal information without consent, uh, uh, where you know to do so would be reasonably necessary for, for its business uh, functions or activities. The difference is uh, is really in the rigor uh, that is uh, that is required. There is no kind of formal balancing test uh, that you'd have to perform or assessment uh, as you would uh, in a legitimate interest uh, application uh, in, in G under GDPR. Uh, secondary use is generally a bit more permissible under the Australian Privacy Act, uh, though it still requires consent where an individual wouldn't reasonably expect that secondary use. Uh, there's, uh, there's guidance from the OAIC around what constitutes valid consent, which tracks quite well with GDPR, but the text of the Privacy Act uh, uh, provides for both implied uh, and express consent uh, in different, uh, in different uh, contexts. So we know that uh, it, uh, implied consent would not be uh, would not be a valid consent uh, under GDPR. Uh, some other some other differences are uh, DPOs are not required in Australia. Uh, accountability measures are are far less prescriptive under uh, than under GDPR. Um, so uh, organizations are not required to conduct privacy impact assessments or data protection impact assessments. Uh, nor maintain a record of processing activities. Now, in practice, many organizations do both of those things just to demonstrate their compliance with broader principles and, and as, as a best practice. Uh, we do have breach notification obligations uh, that came into, uh, into force in 2018, uh, but the notifications are, the, the timelines for notifications are much more permissive than under GDPR. So organizations have 30 days to conduct an assessment of a breach to determine if it's notifiable and then notify the OEIC and, uh, and uh, any affected individuals uh, as soon as practicable once they've made that determination. Uh, we don't include the distinction between controllers and processors. Uh, and that's been a big point of contention uh, and concern especially for organizations that would typically be a processor uh, because uh, they, they aren't able to, you know, really narrow the scope of their responsibilities uh, under the Privacy Act in the way that you can as a processor uh, under, under GDPR, where ultimately uh, the controller is, is, is responsible for most of that compliant, I appreciate there are some crossover things like security uh, where uh, where processors are, are similarly uh, uh, accountable. Um, Cross-border transfers, uh, again, are generally permitted uh, so long as the organization that's transferring the information out of Australia takes appropriate steps to ensure that the recipient's going to comply with the Australian uh, privacy principles. Uh, and that organization that's sending uh, the information out will remain accountable for anything that that recipient does with the personal information. Uh, we don't have we don't have data portability uh, requirements within the Privacy Act, uh, but Australia has uh, enacted something called the Consumer Data Rights uh, Regime. And that requires organizations to provide access to certain customer data via standardized and mandated APIs uh, and only on the basis of explicit customer consent. And now that's being rolled out on a sector by sector basis. So starting with banking uh, and then uh, moving on, uh, it started with banking in 2020 and it'll be moving on now to the energy sector and then telecommunications, and then we'll see where it goes uh, after that. And then finally, uh, the last uh, real uh, important distinction uh, between GDPR and Australia's privacy regime really has to do with scope. And where that comes into play is with the, some of the exemptions uh, under Australia's Privacy Act 
which exclude uh, certain organizations from coverage uh, under the Privacy Act. So the first one is the small business exemption. Uh, the small business exemption excludes uh, from the scope of the Privacy Act businesses whose revenue is less than three million uh, Australian dollars. And, and and there are exceptions to this uh, to the exemption uh, for certain businesses such as health services and and credit brokers and and data brokers. Uh, they are still within the scope of the Act, but the impact of this exemption is to exclude between 90 and 95% of all Australian businesses uh, from any obligations under the Privacy Act, uh, regardless of the fact that we know, of course, they're collecting personal information and using it in their normal business operations. So that means no privacy notices, it means no rights of individuals, uh, no access rights, uh, no breach reporting, uh, for for organizations who are who are within that exemption, and the the second exemption uh, to call out is the uh, employee records exemption, and that excludes uh, from protection under the Act employee records held by an organization that's covered by an Act uh, by by the Act. So that means that employees and former employees have limited means to make access, correction, uh, deletion requests. And further, if, if employers, uh, employers have no transparency obligations toward collecting personal information uh, in employee records, uh, they don't have obligations to appropriately secure such records. And if an employer were to suffer a breach and, and disclosed a bunch of employee records, including if they had sensitive information uh, in them, uh, they wouldn't have to notify the OAIC, our regulator, uh, and they wouldn't have to notify the, the employees affected. Now, many organizations uh, still do the right thing. They have employee privacy policies and, and they, they treat employee uh, personal information uh, as though the Privacy Act does apply. Um, but the exemption is, is, quite, is quite broad. Uh, and combined between the employee records exemption and the small business exemption, uh, I think uh, I think these exemptions are really the greatest barrier to Australia receiving an adequacy finding uh, from the EU because of how much data processing uh, it, it excludes from the scope of our law. It's fascinating because whenever I look at a law from a high level requirements or principles perspective, it looks similar, but when you mm. go deep, that's when, as they say, the devil is in the detail. And when you go in the detail, it's so different, it's so varying. And with the exemptions that you explained, that explains, I mean, Australia is not in the list of adequate countries at the moment. And right. the New Zealand is, or some other countries are, and that explains why. But I heard that the Australian data protection regime is being reviewed because the last review was in 2012, if I remember. Mm. That's what you mentioned earlier in the uh, yep. uh, conversation. So is that review likely to see more uh, proximity to the EU regime or you see things will remain the same? I think it will. I think it will. There are um, the scope of the review is quite broad. So the um, the review of the Privacy Act uh, really kicked off at the end of 2020, and it's being led by Australia's uh, Attorney General's uh, Department. And yeah, uh, you know, as you pointed out, there are certainly some areas where Australia is lagging behind, um, you know, much of the rest of the world uh, from a privacy, uh, from a privacy law standpoint. And so when it, when the review kicked off that started with an issues paper, just to give you some of the uh, context for where we are in, in that review. It started with an issues paper uh, and industry responded to that issues paper uh, that was issued by the Attorney General's department. Uh, then the, uh, the AG's department uh, took all those responses and used that to inform a discussion paper. And that included some specific proposals for, uh, for changes uh, to come. Uh, that 
uh, then had responses from industry and, and the AG's department just published, I think, 199 uh, responses. So quite a bit of, uh, of engagement from Australian uh, individuals and organizations uh, on this topic. And the discussion draft itself was 200 pages. So that, that shows you kind of the extent uh, to which uh, they're really looking at, at changes in the act. And so I'm happy to take you through a few of the highlights and, and areas where I think we will see some change or, or that are at least uh, the, the more controversial ones that are up for, for discussion. Uh, the, uh, the first one is that definition of personal information. You know, as, as we talked about earlier, this distinction between whether something is about an individual or relates to them, uh, I think we will see that change to the, the language change to relates to uh, to track uh, much more closely with uh, GDPR and, and other regimes. I think as part of that change, we will also see a formal recognition that technical metadata such as IP addresses, uh, location data, GUIDs, as well as inferred data, uh, such as categorization of individuals into segments, uh, will all be brought explicitly within the scope of the act as as personal information uh, to the extent that they're associated with an identifiable person. Uh, next is consent. Uh, you know, we talked about how we have this notion of implied consent and, and express consent in the act. Um, I think uh, consent will certainly continue to be a, a lawful basis uh, for some uh, for, for some activities. But I think the act, the the update will clarify uh, the mean the, the way to get consent is through uh, is is through uh, express uh, opt in uh, consent uh, to track much more closely to um, to Article Seven uh, of, of the GDPR. Uh, we'll likely see a new fairness and reasonableness test uh, that applies in kind of an overarching manner to all collection use and disclosure. <clears throat> now that would be similar to what you find in Article 5 of GDPR. And I, I also see it as a bit analogous to, uh, to the jurisprudence under the FTC Act uh, in the US uh, that looks at addressing privacy issues as unfair and deceptive trade practices. So it gives the regulator some flexibility in how they pursue uh, cases that may be otherwise compliant but have a fairness um, uh, issue. Uh, I think we'll get some some right of erasure uh, in in the update. Uh, I think the measures uh, will uh, will be bolstered. So we'll probably have privacy impact assessments uh, being required at least for high risk data processing activities. Uh, I think the cross-border transfer rules are likely to stay unchanged. Uh, I don't think we'll have kind of a master list in the same way and, and kind of that recognition in the same way that the EU does of kind of approved countries to send places to, uh, to, to send data to, I should say. Uh, we may see the introduction of Australia's own standard contractual clauses. Uh, I... I I think we could see changes on and, and an introduction of the controller and processor distinction. I wouldn't have said that until I saw the latest uh, responses from from industry to the AG's discussion paper. But I have to say, the the number one theme seems to be uh, controllers and processors uh, as, as I read through the the responses. Uh, now, this would be a quite significant change to implement. Uh, and quite a departure from the current regime. But given the volume of feedback uh, from, from industry, uh, I think that that could reasonably be, um, be considered. Uh, fines are, are undoubtedly going to rise. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the maximum fine of 2.1 million Australian dollars, not necessarily dissuasive for, um, you know, for very large uh, organizations. Uh, so I think that will definitely increase the current proposed maximum being the greater of 
10 million Australian dollars, uh, three times the value of the benefit gained by the non-compliance, which I think is an interesting uh, approach, uh, or 10% of annual turnover in Australia. Uh, and then, and then finally, you know, back to those exemptions, uh, I think both the, the small business exemption and the, and the employee records exemption uh, are, are targets for elimination. Now, now the small business community is understandably concerned about taking on further regulatory burdens. And if you combine uh, those concerns with the recent impact that COVID-19 has had on small businesses, it's, it's possible that the government will, will leave the small business exemption in place, at least in some form, and maybe they'll lower the revenue threshold to bring a few more uh, organizations within the scope of the act. Um, and similarly, on the employee records exemption, uh, some organizations are concerned that they're going to get flooded with access requests from uh, you know former former employees, as you know we we see uh, we know that or organizations struggle with some of that uh, in Europe. Nonetheless, if if one or or both of those exemptions remain, uh, I think it will be highly unlikely uh, for Australia to receive an adequacy finding from the EU. Um, so. We'll, we'll see. I, I would suggest keeping those the standard contractual clauses handy uh, if you're going to be transferring to Australia anytime soon. That's interesting because uh, if the exemptions go away, there's a good probability that Australia would qualify for the uh, EU adequacy. And if they don't, then there's a good probability the situation in terms of adequacy would remain. That's how it seems because that's going to be uh, the showstopper or the point that determines adequacy in my view, because for the rest of it, it's going to bring or going to be more closer to what we are saying, the European data protection standards. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think undoubtedly there, there will still be differences, but you know, just as there's differences between uh, the GDPR and uh, Japan uh, and, and their privacy regime, but they're uh, kind of, a palatable uh, differences and, and differences that um, that that I think are still aligned from a from a conceptual standpoint. Uh, but yeah, I think you're right. These these exemptions kind of stick out as uh, as something that is just too much of a departure for uh, for an adequacy finding. Mm -hmm. And especially when we look at the Australian data protection regime and it's changing or it's in transition, mm. do you see? the privacy professionals or people like you who are leading the privacy in an organization facing some challenges because of that because you know you're implementing something and then that's likely to change is that happening a lot well we have had um we have had some recent changes uh with kind of breach notification coming in so there was a bit of uh you know, work that needed to be done to to prepare for that um, for the organizations uh, that were subject to the consumer data right, that has caused some um, uh, some need for change. But you know, I think ultimately, uh, privacy and data protection professionals in Australia have largely the same challenges that you see elsewhere in, in the world. Um, you know, getting sufficient buy-in and, and resources from senior leadership, uh, finding talent yeah, is, is quite hard. Uh, raising awareness, driving cultural change within an organization to get everyone pulling in the same direction on privacy and not thinking that privacy is something that, you know, that team over there does, but is something that, you know, we all play a part in. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have, we have challenges over, you know, that concept of how, how centralized do you go and how federated, uh, how much do you federate a privacy program? And, also back to you know getting those privacy requirements built into technology infrastructure and systems uh, by getting in early rather than trying to add privacy fixes later in the process or higher up in the technology stack and you know I think those are are challenges that are um, unfortunately quite universal uh, for uh, for so many of us it's indeed always interesting to note that wherever you talk, the challenges are same. It's a talent mm. issue, it's a buy-in issue, it's a budget issue, it's a management or it's mm. ownership issue because 
it's always thought those few people in the privacy office would take care of privacy while it's everyone else's business and they are there to help you but that's yep. the fascinating part now at this moment i like to ask you some choice questions so you mentioned about the expressed consent or the implicit or implied consent mm -hmm. which model do you prefer as a person because if you see these days on websites especially cookies it's more or less at least in europe what i see is it's expressed consent and it's quite annoying as well because you go on a website and you do, can't even access it and then essentially you are clicking it while in some other cases you may want to have choice of expressing yourself so what do you prefer Impl implied consent express consent uh, i i prefer express consent but i prefer i prefer a regime that um that provides for other, uh, you know, for, for other lawful bases. I, I don't think consent should be the primary um, mechanism for how we justify collection and use of data in, in many cases, because um, oftentimes people, if, if it's, if what you're collecting is necessary for what you're uh, providing, um, I, I, I think, I think you're right that then it just feels intrusive to people uh, or, or um, uh, cumbersome uh, to people to be asked for, you know, some separate consent, like, hey, I've just asked you to, to do this. Why are you asking me? Is it okay, um, you know, to collect my personal information for it? I've just told you to do it. And, and I'm giving you my personal information. I think where, uh, where, where we run into a challenge is where organizations are, um, are, are, are not necessarily clear and transparent and you don't have that that reasonable expectation among data subjects uh, and they try to address that with consent i think we've seen that uh come through in the belgian uh dpa's uh uh, uh, uh determination on um uh, on the iab's uh framework and that you know the the challenge with consent in that uh, in, in that context is that you have a, a network of uh, of participants who are all exchanging personal information in a way that you know most humans can't comprehend if they sit and read a a, a long white paper on it. Um, yet somehow, um, you know, the expectation is that individuals will have an understanding of what's going on uh, off the basis of a couple sentences. And and that's where I think it, there is a disconnect in in the idea that we can use consent to address uh, such a departure from what you know an individual would reasonably expect. Yeah. And at, earlier in the conversation, you mentioned about personal information, and you in, introduced me to a new concept that you use in Australia. That is, the IP address. It does not belong to me. It's a infrastructural component. Mm. So that means we have two ways of interpreting the personal information or personal data. One is the European way, which is the strictest that we know of. Even your IP address is considered a personal piece of information. And on the other hand, a little bit more liberal regime, let's put it like that, for lack of a better word, which allows saying the network or infrastructure pieces or communication blocks are not personal information, even though they would reveal the person behind it. Which one do you prefer as a person? Well, I I I, I prefer the, the the European interpretation of that, and I should point out that that is not a a settled position in in Australia, and so that it's a topic of, of much debate. You know, if you ask, depending on the on the uh, privacy professional that you ask or the organization uh, that mm -hmm. you ask, you may hear a different interpretation uh, of that, and. You know, many of us uh, will will apply, um, you know, our privacy regime, our, our our privacy controls and processes to include uh, that technical information um, in you know more of a more of a European uh, a, a approach than to say that that's not uh, personal information. Mm -hmm. And another question I'd like to ask you is: You've been a chief privacy officer in many organizations from what i see at least two so when you get in as a chief privacy officer in an organization 
what are the first one or two things you do? Uh, well, it's, um, it's different between uh, which organization uh, you, you're at. I've now done it. I've now done it three times, but it, it, it has to be very contextual. Hmm. The, the one thing that I would say is, is common across the three, when you come in, you have a mandate, you've been hired to come in, especially if you're, if you're coming in to build a team, you're coming in with the expectation that you're, uh, you're going to build something. And I would say, don't miss the opportunity um, to take advantage of that mandate. That's when you can get the resources that you want. It's when you can say, I need a, a system, a privacy management system. Uh, that's when you can get those investments done. The, e uh, the, the easiest uh, way is right, is right when you start. It takes some time to, uh, to settle in and build up a team and understand an organization's culture. But if you know that there are big things that you wanna do that are gonna take financial investment, uh, strike, strike out early on that uh, while you have that mandate um, when, you've, when you've joined uh, just you know, as, as early as you possibly can. That's spot on, I think. In any role, and for that matter, when you join in a senior position, you have the mandate and it's the time to leverage on that mandate. It's time to utilize that mandate. And also if you make a structural change or ask or showcase what's to be done, you are perceived better. Or you yep. are actually delivering value. So with that, I would, when I look at the clock, it seems like we just started, but no, I mean, normally when I feel it looks, seems like we've just started, but when I look at the clock, it's already 40 plus minutes and it didn't seem like that. So if based on this conversation, someone wants to get in touch with you, either from IFDP context or your privacy knowledge or any other way, what would be the best way for someone to connect with you? Oh, probably either uh, via LinkedIn or um, via my IAP, IAPP uh, email address, uh, which is sbollinger at iapp.org. Yeah, and I think we must add, or maybe you want to share something about what do you do as part of IAPP, because that may be relevant for the audiences, especially if they are in Australia, because you are the country manager for Australia in IAPP, if I understood well. Yeah, that's right. I'm I'm their their country leader here, and that uh, in, in, so in that role, I um, I help coordinate our network of uh, Knowledge Net volunteers uh, who are fantastic. Um, they help uh, create Knowledge Net events for us uh, around the country. Um, they find speakers, they find uh, venues, and really bring us together as a privacy community. So it, that's that's really the main focus uh, for me and being. Uh, that representative for IAPP uh, in Australia. That's interesting. And I think that's how I found you and connected with you on LinkedIn. Mm. So that's a good medium to connect with you, connect with you through LinkedIn, as well as to listen to your IAPP or events which you organize and which you speak at. It's yep. always enlightening, uh, enriching. So with that, Stephen, I must say, thank you so much for your time. And it was wonderful to have you and it was very enriching conversation and I learned a lot about the Australian data protection regime. Thanks very much for having me, Puna. It was great. Uh, I, I, I love the podcast and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to be, uh, to, to be featured on it. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Fit for Privacy helps you to create a culture of privacy and manage risks by creating, defining, and implementing a privacy strategy that includes delivering scenario-based training for your staff. We also help those who are looking to get certified in CIPPE, CIPM, and CIPT through on-demand courses that help you prepare and practice for certification exam. Want to know more? Visit www.fitforprivacy.com. That's www.fit4privacy.com. Thanks for listening. If you liked the show, feel free to share it with a friend and write a review. If you have already done so, thank you so much. And if you did not like the show, don't bother and forget about it. Take care and stay safe. Until next time, goodbye.
If you have questions or suggestions, feel free to drop an email at hello at fitforprivacy.com. That's hello at F-I-T, the number four, privacy.com.